let me officially begin uh, and welcome everyone to this very important discussion today. It's the first of what I hope will be several dialogues that we have. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of individuals across our Great Lakes coast here on Lake Erie uh, have been helping us try to uh, organize properly in order to access the funds that Congress passed in HR 3684, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. It was signed on November 15th last year, and it's over 1,000 pages long. If I were your professor, I would encourage you to get that bill online and to read every word. You are capable of it, every person online here. We have special guests with us today, and we'll be hearing from them in a bit. Grace Gallucci, uh, who represents the major regional planning authority in Northeastern Ohio, especially specializing in transportation. Uh, and then uh, Colonel Eli Adams and Ron Kozlowski from the Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, of course, our mother station is in Buffalo. And uh, so we're in the same ecosystem in a sense. And we welcome them uh, today. And then Lee Geis, who is the director of the Blue Green Alliance, she will be uh, talking with us about broadband and about energy. And uh, so others are still logging on as I begin this discussion. But uh, let me say that the purpose of this bill is America building forward, all right? Not looking in the rear view mirror. This bill is transformational. It actually passed through a committee called Transportation and Infrastructure one of our major committees in the Congress, in both chambers. And uh, so the initials of transportation and infrastructure are T and I. For me, those two letters have a different meaning. One is transformational and the other one is innovative, all right? Transformational and innovative. This is not a bill that looks backward. It looks forward and it expects more of the American people. It is the most significant bill in our lifetime to advance our nation and its economy and infrastructure. It's expected to create just in the first year, 1.3 million jobs and to do so as we continue over its five years of life. I wanna thank each of you for joining us. You are all leaders what you know, what you've experienced, what you've done is now essential. The nation is calling you uh, to be the best that we can possibly be in this part of America. We've taken them and we're still standing, but we simply have to do better. Our people are hardworking, but too often shortchanged. This can really make a difference, but it depends on us, on us to lead. What we can achieve together through BIF can maximize its impact for generations to come to improve people's lives. I term our work together in this effort as noble, noble work for the sake of the nation. Now, the purpose of today's discussion is to provide information to you and also to work collaboratively. That's a little bit hard sometimes across jurisdictions, but to be really great in what we do. We must think that way. We have to maximize the impact of this bill in all of its titles, which we will go through with you uh, across our vast region. And we have to be transformative and innovative. You are welcome um, to share your most imaginative ideas when you go home and you have either a cup of coffee or something stronger and say, why don't they do it that way? Or I have this idea, this is the moment. This is the moment you've been waiting for. Now, we are uh, going to be discussing a number of titles of the bill, but I will just read you the major titles because most people, when you talk to the average citizen, they think, well, this is about highways. Oh no, it's about transportation systems, including highways. It's about passenger and freight rail. And boy, do we have to improve our efforts there. It's about airports. It's about public transportation. It's about ports. It's about bringing in dollars to do the proper planning and research in order to achieve the innovation that we are looking for. No university, no institution of higher learning is off the hook. It has a major section on energy, on grid resilience. You might remember when there was a failure here at one of our major energy companies in Ohio, 
we shut off, the electricity was shut off to the entire northern fifth of the United States. Grid resilience, very important. Supply chains for clean energy. Intel making their big investment here in Ohio. We have to have the supply lines in order to feed it. Fuels and technology infrastructure. What will that look like? Where will those installations be placed? I-8090, I-75, I-71? How are we going to look at that regionally? A favorite of mine, hydrogen research and development programs. Nuclear energy infrastructure and fusion, hydropower. How do we work more effectively there? And how do we work with our Canadian brethren? Energy efficiency and building infrastructure. A lot of people don't realize that's in the bill. Our friend, Secretary Marsha Fudge, is the head of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. She cares about building infrastructure. She can be a voice for us if we put our act together here. Another major section deals with water and wastewater. So important across Northern Ohio, facing on Lake Erie, which has so many challenges that we must address. Broadband is another title and cybersecurity. So in other words, this is much more than TAR. This is talking about retooling this entire part of America. We have five years to get the investment dollars and less time to do the planning. We have to think hard about how to be effective. We need your ideas at the most local of level in the smallest towns, in the least populated counties, as well as the biggest cities, and metropolitan areas and those places in between. We have to think together about how to effectively change the way we live and make it much more positive and easier for people and more productive. Now we are going to put up on the screen the median household income chart of every congressional district in this country. Why would we start there? Because there are provisions in this bill that give advantage to those places that represent among the most struggling parts of America. And guess what? We live in one of them. For the members of Congress that represent Northern Ohio, we all rank in the last row, in the last row. And as we understand this, you will see there are provisions for equity. Here's the chart, starting with California district number one. Uh, this particular page goes only to uh, the uh, you, you'll see we're not in the top quarter. You can see that immediately. We're almost, uh, there's a, di a district there around Columbus, uh, which just got the Intel plan. Okay, that's the wealthiest congressional district in Ohio uh, compared to the rest of the state and compared to the rest of the country. And uh, so I'm not surprised to see that, but here's the other side of the page. So you can look to the greater Cleveland area. Here's Captor at the bottom, Chantel Brown below her. Uh, you can look at uh, Congressman Ryan, who's now running for the uh, U.S. Senate, and you can look at the names. Congresswoman Beatty, she's number 376. Uh, Congressman Johnson, number 364. Uh, those districts are not up here, but my point to you is we have a greater call at these various federal departments because our need is greater because so much of our industry has been washed out and outsourced. So median household income is important for you to have as we think about developing our application. Uh, we also have for you, as we attempt to uh, gain the best knowledge through you, we have a handout, I call it the crib sheet. This is only 10 pages long. It's not a thousand pages long to read. I went through the bill and I highlighted different words that would draw up in you ideas about oh, what might we be able to do in our area that I may not have thought of? Uh, there are grants that pr uh, promote great workforce development, which we need in our region. There are um, uh, incentives for toll roads. I keep looking at I-8090 and thinking, hmm, what else could we do with that? We do automated container shipping to Chicago from Cleveland. Uh, how do we look at our transportation systems? What about I-71, I-75 to Columbus? What about automated systems to do that? What about connecting some way our universities can be like a triangle, university triangles, be able to get their people who use them more quickly? Uh, what might that 
uh, look like. We're not leaving universities off the hook here. What about capped gas and oil wells across our region? People don't remember John Rockefeller began his life in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, we have a lot of capped problems around the region. What about those? How do we modernize a freight rail and passenger rail through this region between Chicago and Cleveland? What does that look like? Very, very important. So this 10 page summary um, is really uh, some, like a word game for you. You can, you can look through it. We'll make sure you get it av made available to you and you can circle or highlight concerns in your area. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put those together and see what, do we have some kind of a image that's developing across the region that would help us put our work together. So you will get that piece. Um, we also will provide you with a longer summary of the entire bill by title. I encourage you to read that. It's only 20 pages long, but you'll begin to get a sense of the breadth of what this bill intends. Finally, I wanna say uh, as we begin that of the money in the bill, $1.3 trillion, $1.3 trillion for the nation. One third of that money goes by formula to every state in the union, and then they give it out where they want. So part of your attention has to be focused on the state of Ohio. And what are they doing with the money that they've been given? We've provided you with a summary, we call it a BIF funding summary, showing you how much Ohio's gotten. For example, I'll just pick one category. They've gotten $483 million for bridges. What are they doing with it? We have a lot of bridges up here. Uh, they're getting uh, at least 100 million for high-speed broadband internet for places that aren't connected. What are they doing with it, all right? So one third of the bill goes by formula. If they're all asleep down there in Columbus, they get all this money, all right? One third, they don't have to do anything except exist. All right, now the other two thirds is competitive. And that's one of the reasons for this broadcast today to say, we're gonna compete in every category. We're gonna figure out a way to do this and to maximize the return to a region that has been shortchanged for my entire career in Congress. As hard as we've worked, the, we do not have the same footing at the federal level. We have fewer members of Congress than other states. We don't have the kind of infrastructure it's been harmed, the human infrastructure because of all the job washout we've had. So we have to combine our forces in order to be as effective as California or the East Coast. Um, and, uh, and we intend to do that. So uh, we are going to give you help all along the way. Grace Gallucci is with us today and we'll be speaking in just a second. But in our office, we have a gentleman named David, David Zavak. We will type his name on the screen and his phone number. He will be available as well as John Howes in Washington to field calls from anyone listening. And we will continue this conversation so you won't be left alone. Here in the western end of our district, since we cover the whole coast almost, uh, we have passed the Toledo Lucas County Library uh, and their phone will be put on the screen now, 419-259-5244, to form a task force because we are going to help you be aware of every competitive grant as well as every formula grant that goes to uh, the state of Ohio. So you know that you can tee up and ask for the projects in your area. We're gonna do the same through Grace to find a team of people on the Eastern side of the district that will work with us. So we are working in sync. One of the projects I wanna work on with all of you and with our Metro Parks is developing a pathway between Cleveland all the way across the lake to Toledo. And then I'm gonna take it up into Michigan and up to the dunes and over into Indiana. And we will have a Great Lakes pathway built by the time we're done working with the Cuyahoga Valley National Recreation Area in other words. So we are serious about our work. Um, now, I wanted to um, say that there's a chat on this Zoom. You can type in comments there. We will follow up on all of them. But I also wanna give you some oddities that are in the bill that you might not be thinking about. One is, a uh, multimodal transportation system between our watershed and region, our watersheds and region and Canada. What could that look like? How do we connect multimodal Canadian rail? If you listen to the debate in Congress, they talked about Amtrak going up the East Coast. And then when it got way up there toward Canada, they're gonna have a little bit of a uh, connection problem with Canadian rail. Well, we wanna connect port, rail, land, multimodally, 
How do we do that with our Canadian brethren, our largest trading partner? Big thoughts. What do we do across Lake Erie? If you were up to me, I'd build a channel right underneath. Uh, and I would move goods just like they do with them um, across the English Channel uh, between Britain and France. Uh, we'll see how big we can think about this. I guess the old Governor Rhodes of Ohio used to want to build a bridge across the islands uh, uh, from uh, our coast to Point Pelee. Maybe we should do that. But we should have big ideas, not just teeny weeny little ideas. We should transform this coast and we need your help to do it. We have something in Toledo called Hoffman Road Landfill and the gas belches out. You can see it come out in a big plume. We're wasting all of that gas. For any landfill in the region, how do we turn it into a power source? What do we do? For the nuclear power plants in the region that are belching uh, high levels of thermal energy into Lake Erie every day, and our Canadian brethren are doing that up in Ontario, how do we capture that thermal energy and turn it into power? That's our job. What about automated corridors? I've mentioned that a little bit, but uh, Cleveland, Toledo, the Turnpike, Columbus, Chicago, how do we look at this region in a new way? For those of you who live near White House, how can we take care of the historic restoration of that bridge they're talking about ripping down? It's the place all artists go in the region. It has a history here. There's money in this bill to accommodate it. We ought to apply. Lake Erie Coastal Resilience, uh, frankly, uh, Colonel, I've wondered about the roads that exist adjacent to the lake. I was just in Bay Village the other day and we were talking about erosion. We were talking about coastal resiliency. If we look at Lake Erie from one end to the other, how do we, come to, we become the Cape Cod of the Midwest? How do we work with the core? How do we work with all of our metro parks, all of our mayors, all of our county commissioners to produce the Midwestern version of Cape Cod? It already exists but it's fragmented, it isn't well-planned, it's kind of scattershot here and there, and we have such talent that is on the line today. Okay, so those are my opening remarks, um, and uh, everything will be recorded, so this can be clipped and shared with others who may not be able to be on the call, but I want to introduce you now to an astounding resource for our region. This woman, I don't know how long she's worked in the Cleveland area, I don't really know Grace Gallucci, she's absolutely extraordinary. And what she is working on, she one of the first times she came to see me was about this project called Hyperloop. And I hope you reference that, Grace, in your remarks. Uh, it is a breathtaking idea for high-speed movement of people and goods across this country, starting in this region. So let me introduce to you the director of the Northeast Ohio Area-Wide Coordinating Agency, Grace Gallucci. Welcome. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Kaptur. It is um, an honor and a pleasure to be invited to participate in this webinar. Uh, before I begin, I want to thank you for all that you do for Northern Ohio. Uh, you are not only a big thinker, but you're a big doer. And we could not be represented by anyone better. So thank you uh, for being our leader. Um, next slide, please. I am the executive director uh, yeah, of the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization for Greater Cleveland. We represent 2.1 million in population, which covers five counties, 166 cities, villages, and towns. We have a board of 48 members and it's uh, local elected officials. Uh, the idea is that your Metropolitan Planning or Organization represents the alignment of local priorities. We don't do anything alone. We work with those at the federal level, the state level, and um, many people within the region. Next slide, please. So Noaka is the five counties surrounding Greater Cleveland. Uh, this is a map of the other MPOs in Ohio. Uh, clearly, we're all familiar with Timacog um, in Toledo. Uh, that covers uh, four and a half counties. And then we also have um, Erie uh, County Regional Planning Commission. So between Noaka, Erie, and Timacog, that really covers uh, Marcy Captor's area. And the ideas that we have been working on do, in terms of the Great Lakes, cross over those MPOs and across the state. So we do need to think bigger than even our own regions. Next slide. So what does an MPO do? For those of you that don't know, um, 
A quick sentence is we determine how federal transportation dollars are spent. Um, how do we do that? We do that through planning and funding. Uh, relative to planning, we conduct transportation and environmental planning. Uh, that includes prioritizing and approving transportation projects for federal funding. We do that by developing a 20-year long-range plan, a four-year transportation improvement program, and then an annual priority list. So we go from planning to programming to construction. Also, we have the ability to fund some of the plans that we develop because Congress does allocate a share of the federal dollars directly to the MPOs for regionally significant projects. Next slide. So to kind of give you an idea of how much money that is, uh, for NOACA, and we are the largest MPO in Ohio, uh, so we probably have a little bit more, more money on our side than uh, some of the other MPOs, but essentially for all of us, MPOs receive less than 10% of the federal gas tax. The other 90 plus percent goes to the state DOTs. And so some of it goes to transit agencies as well, but the state DOTs. And so when we talk about um, projects and programs to benefit our region, we have to think about not only our 10% that we're able to put towards projects and leverage funding, but we have to think about how to capitalize upon the other funding that goes to the DOTs. And so what does that mean? That means that we really need to think about the projects that are in alignment with our DOT. So working with ODOT to ensure that our priorities are consistent with their priorities, or maybe more importantly, that their, their priorities are consistent with our priorities. Next slide. Grace, before you get off that slide, could I just ask you uh, to make a statement if you can. Um, I-8090, I believe as a state toll road turnpike has not gotten a penny of federal money since it was first built. Am I correct in that uh, belief? You are correct. Um, it was initially established as a toll road by the state of Ohio. It was subsequently aligned and utilized as part of the federal highway system uh, when that was being built, uh, but it doesn't receive federal funds. It, it still collects tolls. And as you know, the history, at some point in time, it was supposed to uh, go to be a freeway after it paid off the bonds in 30 years after construction. Uh, but that was modified and additional bonds were issued in order to expand to a third lane. And then subsequent to that, more recently in the last decade, additional bonds were issued for projects that have a nexus to the turnpike, but are not necessarily on the turnpike. I uh, just so want that's what this artery is very important to us, right? And we are double we are double taxed. The federal tax you pay for gas, okay, when it's given back to Ohio, they don't put it on the turnpike, all right? Uh, we pay, the people that live up here, our businesses and so forth, people, we pay to go on that turnpike. And so that money goes down to the state, all right? But it's more expensive to live here because of the way that turnpike operates. I'm not against the turnpike. I use it all the time. They make money off of me and they keep the roads real nice, but maybe that easement has a greater purpose is my point. And maybe with this infrastructure bill, we can partner with the Turnpike Commission. I don't know if they're on the line today or not, but we need to look at every asset we have and think forward, not backward about what we're going to do as a region. Thank you for let, letting me say that. Sure, and actually, Congressman, uh, Congresswoman, I will add to that. Um, one of the things that we have explored utilizing the Turnpike 4 is the Hyperloop. And so when you talk about Route 80 and 90, those are the two largest interstates in the country, one going from San Francisco to New York, the other going from Seattle to Boston. And they intersect in two places, Cleveland and Chicago. So that corridor, which is entirely a toll road, is very critical to both passengers and freight. Recognizing that, we started looking at uh, the next evolution of high-speed rail, which really ends up being a cross between an airplane and a rail system, the Hyperloop, and the Turnpike has been a partner of ours. So the Turnpike uh, who sits on NOACA's board, 
uh, did contribute funding to help us develop that initial feasibility study. So they are very open to working with us to better utilize that easement. Um, but I still wanna emphasize your point that uh, most of your constituents who are along uh, the turnpike, uh, which might be all of your constituents, um, are being double taxed. We pay, um, I have an easy pass and I drive through there uh, very frequently. I have uh, huge bills from the toll road. And yes, we pay that plus we pay the gas tax. So we are being double billed as we travel on that particular roadway. So we have to think about how best uh, to compensate the folks who utilize and pay for the tollway also for being taxed by the gas tax. So next slide, please. Uh, NOAC's vision statement, similar to many um, other MPOs, uh, we talk about strengthening regional cohesion, preserving existing infrastructure, and building a sustainable multimodal transportation system. Why do we do it? To support economic development and enhance quality of life. Next slide. Uh, with that vision statement, uh, that guided us into development of our long range plan. Our long range plan is EMEO 2050, was adopted last year by the board and really speaks to um, a long range plan that is intended to be equitable. Next slide, please. And as we developed our long range plan, it is no coincidence that our themes align with the themes of the IIJA or the uh, the bill. Uh, so clearly, we have um, whoops, we have clearly um, aligned equity, access to multimodal transportation system, mobility, safety, emissions, asset management, technology adaptation. What does this mean? What it means for us and many of the MPOs across the nation, and certainly across Ohio and Northern Ohio, it means that we have developed a plan that lays the groundwork for accessing the funds in the new legislation. Next slide. Uh, some of the uh, items in terms of a quick overview of the IIJA, uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, um, as Congresswoman stated, it was approved by Congress and signed into law by the president at the end of last year. Uh, relative to transportation, it reauthorizes the FAST Act for another five years, and 1.2 trillion of it over 10 years goes to transportation. So about half of it goes to transportation. Um, and then about half of that goes to surface transportation. Next slide, please. Um, it is a historic investment in the nation's infrastructure. It is more than transportation. Half of it's transportation, but there's also the other half for drinking water, wastewater, energy, and others. Um, other aspects of it, it is intended to um, look at improving the overall processes while uh, maintaining environmental standards. Next slide. Um, there's also provisions in there that speak to how the MPOs operate, uh, requiring a proportional board of representation and uh, requiring to use 2.5% of planning funds for complete street activities. Also encouraging to coordinate transportation planning without housing and economic development. So there's a lot of activity um, that we work on that now will be strengthened. Next. How is, the, uh, how is this legislation paid for? There was no increase in the gas tax. Uh, last time it was increased was 1993. Uh, so there's a transfer from the general fund and other kinds of funding. Um, but just looking at it as um, it is more of the continuing kind of pay fors as opposed to any new tax. Uh, next slide, please. The new spending, so out of the 1.2 billion, about half of it is um, existing spending and half of it is new spending. And when you look at it that way, about half of it goes to transportation and the other half goes to other infrastructure. So you're looking at about a quarter of the new spending, I'm sorry, quarter of the entire bill, half of the new spending going to transportation. 
Next slide. Uh, new spending categories, you look all the way at the bottom, you see roads and bridges is the single largest item, uh, but clearly many, many, many other uh, categories of spending for very important infrastructure. Next Grace, slide. I'm going to interrupt and just oh, say sure. on the roads and bridges, if I could, I am very concerned about bridges across this region, particularly those, let's say, that Norfolk Southern and CSX go under uh, or over all the time. And these uh, trestles, the, the, the structures holding them up, they are absolutely, in so many places, complete blighting influences in communities. And so for those listening, please, if you have any of those in your area, we want to map them. We want to work with the railroad companies. We want to clean this up. Mm -hmm. And uh, also for cross river structures. Uh, I was told in the Toledo region, we should at least put on the map for consideration, a new passenger rail bridge uh, across the uh, Maumee River. Uh, I was unaware that there was even a proposal for that. So please, you spend every day doing this, make sure we map what's needed, every single person that's listening and uh, help us do the best job we can do. Thank you for letting me interrupt. Sure, thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, quickly going through new spending, uh, the roads and bridges at 110, but we also have transit, safety, uh, ports and waterways, um, EV charging and rail. Next slide. We currently receive $67 billion, when I say we, as a country, for uh, transportation in the FAST Act. Um, in the coming years, looking at the next year, we will be getting about a 64% increase to 110 billion, and then it stays in that neighborhood throughout 2026. Next slide. The formula implications for Ohio, uh, we have a 30% increase in federal aid highway formula. That's $9.2 billion. Um, you know, one of the things I'd like to encourage um, the state is because we do have the turnpike where we pay our own way, perhaps there ought to be other federal funding that is put towards additional projects in Northern Ohio. Um, also uh, with the increases in highway safety, motor carrier, uh, formula grants, there really is a lot of funding available by formula, which means we get it without having to compete. And we get it without having to compete as a state, but how the state chooses to allocate those funds are typically not formula. So we may have to compete or we may have to at least work with them to ensure that alignment. Um, also the impact on Ohio, it allows us to compete for new funding at the federal level, particularly for rail and airports. And there's a billion dollars in there for Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So big impact on Ohio. Uh, next slide. Over five years for surface transportation, we have over a billion dollars. Infra and RAIS, which our programs we're accustomed to, will continue. But then we also have new programs like the National Infrastructure project assessment or the bridge investment uh, grants, promoting resiliency, charging and fueling infrastructure, rural transportation, next slide, and many others, including congestion relief, safe streets, healthy streets, um, emissions, smart programs, et cetera. Next. Let, uh, Grace, I'm gonna interrupt and say at sure. our ports, there are, uh, there's money in the bill to, um, somehow capture emissions from uh, diesel operated vehicles, uh, trucks, ferries, there's money in there for ferry boats. We have ferries in Lorraine and we have them in Port Clinton. So as we look across the region, um, I, and I don't know if Cleveland has a ferry, I think they do. Um, but in any case, you know, for tugboats, we have a lot of boats. We are, our, our recreational boating industry here is a $16 billion industry. Uh, $7 billion fishing industry. Uh, there is money in the bill to deal with uh, getting rid of CO2, getting rid of these emittents in the atmosphere. And we want to make sure our port authorities know that and that uh, those who are involved in commerce uh, on the sea, uh, as well as land, uh, use these funds. Thank you. Yeah, that's terrific. 
Uh, we've previously used uh, congestion mitigation air quality dollars for improvements at the port. So this will be welcome to have additional funding sources. Um, one, of the controversial, one of the controversial issues at the western end of Lake Erie, not the eastern end. Uh, at the western end, we have the Enbridge pipeline coming under Lake Erie. And there's a big, uh, big controversy uh, that involves the courts, two countries, Canada and the United States, uh, because the, a boat, I guess, an anchor or something, nicked the pipeline up around Mackinac. And the oil spill is a, is a huge uh, threat. So one of the questions for us is, as we move forward with Build Back Better, uh, with the infrastructure bill, what do we do with the Enbridge pipeline uh, to maintain safety? And if we're going underwater, uh, Colonel, just think about this with us, um, then what else do we build? If we're gonna put another container around Enbridge uh, for safety, whatever the courts say we have to do, what do we do there? Over on the eastern side of the of Lake Erie, we have a proposal by LEADCO to build the first offshore wind turbines in the Great Lakes. It's caught up in a court suit right now, but it's extremely important to all those who are working on that to produce energy uh, offshore in the Cleveland region. And we need to pay attention to that proposal and to the extent that it moves from the courts, try to help to achieve what those who've worked so hard for so many years are trying to do. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna highlight a couple of uh, specific things that are important to Northern Ohio. Next slide, please. Rail, there's a historic increase for Amtrak, and this is really important for the Northeast Corridor. That's what everybody wants and everybody talks about. Um, there's $6 billion there, but the national network has 16, and we would like a large piece of that for Northern Ohio. We are looking at um, competing for funding to improve the Cleveland to Chicago corridor, which of course goes through Sandusky and Toledo, um, as well as other Amtrak expansion plans, which is Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati perhaps, as well as other um, individual um, uh, routes coming out of Cleveland, uh, Cleveland being placed as a mini hub. Next slide. Uh, before you get off that yep. one, Grace, I just yep. want to say the former director of the National Railway Commission, Jolene Molitaris, lives in Ohio. She's retired now. And she told me, she said, Marcy, whatever you do working with your people up there in northern Ohio, she said, make sure you also speak with the private carriers, uh, private rail carriers, because maybe they and Amtrak can work a deal where we could get service between Cleveland and uh, Columbus or Toledo and Columbus uh, or other places, you know. Uh, it, was, it was a very interesting conversation, and I will assure everyone on the line, we have negotiated now with every member of Congress from South Chicago all the way through Cleveland, that whole route, Republican and Democrat, we are united in wanting to have a streamlined Amtrak service, passenger service, that um, isn't constantly bumped off the tracks by uh, CSX and Norfolk Southern. Uh, we have to put these parties together and figure out a solution for the future and not act like it's 1950. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, transit, there's additional uh, funding. There's $108 billion for public transit over the five years with a focus on safety, modernization, climate, and equity. Uh, next. Active transportation, there's an increased focus on active transportation, period. So in addition to uh, funding, 70% boost. Uh, there's all types of other programs that will focus on active transportation. Next. Bridges, this is what you mentioned nurse earlier. There is historic funding and eligibility expansion in this law. Um, in addition to the $26.5 billion bridge replacement program that was just launched, um, the eligibility is expanded in that um, bridges that are not part of the federal highway system are now eligible. Uh, there's a 15% carve out for those bridges, which then includes the rail bridges that you referred to earlier, uh, Congresswoman Kaptur. So that's really good news considering Ohio is, uh, I think we have the second highest number of bridges in the nation. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Very important, uh, very important uh, category there. Thank you, Grace, for pointing it out. Sure, next slide, please. 
um, airports, not our jurisdiction, but wanted to point out that there is a uh, significant number of uh, programs and dollars for airport as well, both for the tower control and airside projects. This is really important for Cleveland as they are uh, looking to implement their um, airport master plan. And we're looking at the roadways into the airport. Uh, next, please. We need, Grace, we need to put our airport uh, talents together here across mm -hmm. the north because with the chain, with the deregulation of the airline industry, it's now resulted in, you know, a few big carriers and a lot of small carriers. Cleveland has been hurt. Uh, Toledo has been hurt. Uh, we have Ottawa Erie in between. Uh, we have Plumbrook that wants to get its own airstrip because they bring in heavy payloads for a lot of the NASA construction. We somehow have to put together our airport talent across the north to give us a big vision, whatever that is. Maybe it's that we're going to go commercial small craft. Maybe it's helicopters. I don't know what it is, but it seems to me that we ought to really have a very in-depth discussion about air flight and this region. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, it's, a, it, it's the right approach. Uh, so what's next? Federal agencies will issue regulations and guidance. Uh, the state will look at the apportionments for funding and particularly for local match. Next slide, please. Um, NOACA and other MPOs will analyze their long range plans for that alignment and look for eligible projects that um, can be funded uh, through formula, grain opportunities, and other. So what does that mean for everybody else? Next, the communities, organizations, municipalities, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, can work with us. Uh, we can certainly, all MPOs are there to help you evaluate projects against the federal criteria, to coordinate with the state DOT, to provide data for justifying your projects, evaluating project readiness, and providing support. Um, also, our responsibility is uh, to ensure that all the projects that we are looking to fund with the new law is included or are included in our long range plan. And that uh, when we look at multiple projects that will be competing against each other, that the MPO being the local government officials um, have consensus on those priorities. Um, that is my presentation and uh, thank you very much for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you for an excellent presentation, Grace. It was, it was very meaty and important, and I'm sure many people are hearing it for this first time. We're going to take any questions or comments at this point. Uh, uh, I guess the best way to do that, I'm not quite sure, but I guess you just unmute yourself and ask a question. Say who you are and where you're from. Hey, I, this is Lee Geis, uh, Blue Green Alliance, Canton, Ohio. Uh, I had a quick question, um, uh, and that was amazing presentation. Can you confirm, uh, Grace, that there are uh, Buy American provisions uh, associated with these federal dollars, especially when it comes to rail and bridges? Yes, my understanding, and Congresswoman Kaptur can certainly uh, speak to this more fluently is that there are stronger by America regulations that have been included in the um, in the law. And so that will mean uh, more US steel and other raw materials as well as final product will be paid for and put into use in our transportation system. Thank you. Is there another question out there? Surely there is. Okay, so maybe we better move on uh, while people are writing their questions down. Uh, let us uh, now move to Lee Geis from the, she's the executive director of the Blue Green Alliance. Uh, Lee, thank you so very much for joining us. And uh, you are uh, going to focus on the energy as well as broadband sections of the bill. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congresswoman Kaptur. And um, our executive director, Jason Walsh, would probably not uh, be very <laughs> excited if, 
not taking his job. Uh, my title, which who cares, is the regional program director for Ohio. And I just like to say I'm the boots on the ground gal, and that's in Canton, Ohio. So uh, with that, um, thank you so much for all your work for working people here across the great state of Ohio. And thank you to your staff for their patience and willingness to invite us into this important discussion. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to try to go very fast. And I'm also uh, willing to, um, what I skip over, willing to send to Megan so she can distribute if folks want more information on, on the broadband piece and the energy piece. So um, our role here today is to lift up energy, broadband, and workforce provisions in the Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act, uh, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Deal, BIF, um, bipartisan infrastructure law, whatever we want to call it, uh, IIJA is a $1.3 trillion investment in repairing and modernizing the nation's infrastructure. And as you mentioned earlier, was signed into law on November 15th, 2021. The second not yet passed by the Senate part of Build Back Better Act is the Build Back Better Act a historic investment that utilizes the budget, budget reconciliation process to fund important priorities, create good jobs, fight climate change, and bolster the care economy. Uh, the Senate needs to pass the Build Back Better Act now, as we all know. The investments and policies included in the IIJ bill, IIJA bill are an important first step and create good paying union jobs across the nation while helping reduce emissions, the bill will help rebuild and modernize our nation's crumbling infrastructure, as we just heard from that fabulous presentation prior to this, and uh, our, our transportation, water, and energy infrastructure as well. So if we can go to slide two, we'll dive in with broadband. Um, a lot of folks are overlooking this piece, and we shouldn't. Um, it is... Um, Investment in broadband deployment is the biggest in history, spending billions, sending billions of dollars to new and existing programs. This funding will be distributed by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, and to the states. NTIA and the states will develop specific rules for each of the programs and allocations. The following is a brief, very brief summary uh, broadband is key to expanding equity across the country and will help connect communities and essential resources. We'll start with the uh, $42.5 billion to the state broadband deployment program. There's websites here that I would encourage folks to visit. Um, each state will receive a minimum of $100 million. Additional money and final allotment will determine how many underserved communities are uh, given this money in each state, the formula will be determined, and this is an important point, the formula will be determined by the FCC's broadband map. States will prioritize funding to projects involving underserved areas first, then community anchor institutions. A couple examples of that, schools, hospitals, and public safety entities. States also will prioritize funding to high poverty areas and projects that provide high speed, higher speed broadband services. Um, the, uh, there's also the Affordable Connectivity Program um, that is getting $14.2 billion, the Digi Digital Equity Grant Program, $2.75 billion over five years, and there is also the $74 million for the USDA broadband program. Next slide. Uh, Lee, Lee, before yeah. you get off that slide, excuse me, I just wanted to say Ohio, I just wanna reemphasize, will receive $100 million for high-speed broadband. Now, in some communities, uh, whether they're rural communities or whether they're urban neighborhoods, many times they are not connected. That's and right. uh, we have places around Ohio where the kids were having to go on buses and sit out in the cold uh, to connect to Wi-Fi, okay? Up in our area, I hope 
that your organization will work with our library systems and through them connect to our school systems. So no child is left in the cold without the ability to communicate. And um, uh, do I completely trust the state of Ohio on them being able to distribute money up here in the North? No, <laughs> because they, I know what they do on transportation. I know what they do on veterans. I know what they do in so many other areas. We have to fight like the Dickens. And so for those elected officials listening, we across Northern Ohio should unite and believe me, we have the equity arguments on our side for a portion of those dollars to come up here. So perhaps working with our library systems, they can help us identify the tranches of funds and help our local individuals apply together. It's just a thought, but I wanted to throw it out there. Great point. And I think that's a, a, a an awesome starting uh, avenue is to for, for to reach out to the library systems. Sure. Um, next slide. I know this is really hard to read, but um, what I really, really want to point out here is there are webinars being offered by uh, the uh, NTIA administration. And while we've already missed a couple, there are still some opportunities to join. And I would encourage folks, uh, these are the professionals that will tell you, you know, that are administrating these funds and give you so much more information. So I would encourage folks, if you're interested in this piece, please find one of these webinars to join. Um, next slide, yeah. Clean energy projects and infrastructure. Um, we, uh, uh, there are, uh, with the passage of IIJ funds uh, available to state, local, and tribal governments for a variety, a variety of advanced energy infrastructure projects. The bill provides funding to address some of the state and local policymakers' top energy priorities, such as ensuring a reliable electric grid lowering energy bills and supporting energy jobs. I'm just going to take a brief moment to lift up one of these, the $2.5 billion uh, for, the, uh, for the high capacity transmission lines. This will be leveraged by another $2.5 billion in private funds for a total of $5 billion, which would create over 65,000 jobs over 10 years. The build, the, under the Building a Better Grid initiative, DOE will identify critical national transmission needs and support the build out of long distance, high voltage transmission facilities to meet those needs through collaborative transmission planning, innovative financing mechanisms, coordinated permitting, and continued engagement of stakeholders. The department will keep the public informed of its plans activities and progress related to the this Building a Better Grid initiative to expand and improve the nation's electric transmission grid. DOE is committed to a robust engagement and collaboration with states, American Indian tribes, industries, unions, local communities, environmental justice organizations, and other stakeholders. Next slide. Lee, Lee before you go oh. to the next slide, I want to inform everyone on the call. I chair in the U.S. House Yes. the Energy and Water Committee. What does that mean? It means the money that funds the Department of Energy and it actually funds the Army Corps of Engineers and several other instrumentalities of our country. This is a really important part of the bill for our future. When the Ford Avon Lake plant was reopened after the country's housing market crashed in 2008, I was standing next to the president of Ford North America at that site. And they had brought back the heavy truck production from Mexico. And I said, what can I do to help you keep this plant here and to build on heavy truck production from this region? He said, Congresswoman, lower my energy bills by a third. And I stood there mortified because I alone, I wasn't a chair then, but I didn't have the power to do that because we're working with old systems. Now, for everyone listening on the call, particularly those who work in the skilled trades, electrical workers, plumbers and pipe fitters, um, 
people who work in the nuclear energy plants, we need a plan. We need an energy plan to transform this region with modern uh, transmission. I don't know what that is because I don't have a degree in it, all right? But we've got a lot of engineers across the North here. I believe that this part of America is going to recapture the vegetable growing capacity of California. Uh, I think climate change is going to demand it and we're going to have to build new structures in order to produce undercover with what is facing us. And we're gonna need energy. We have the nuclear power up north. It's been terribly managed, not by the workers, but by the business plan of the company that became a criminal operation. All right, so how do you think that makes me feel as a Congresswoman representing these places? It's not so good. So I'm saying to myself, and I've asked several business people, what's the energy model? I said, let's go to, let's go to Niagara Falls. They use hydropower and believe it or not, by an agreement, and it may be with the core kernel for all I know, the state of New York now sends about a percent and a half of power from Niagara to Ohio. And it's used mainly down on the Ohio River. All right, I've been talking to my colleagues in the Great Lakes saying, with this energy provision in the bill, what is the breakthrough idea we could have that would revolutionize energy in this region? The, uh, we know that when the transmission towers from uh, Davis Bessie go all the way out to uh, Blue Star Steel in Fulton County, 75% of the power is lost in transmission. So I've been asking business people at meetings, what's the answer? Here's an answer, Colonel. One of the people said to me, Congresswoman, you take a tube and you lay it across the Southern Rim of Erie from Niagara to Toledo. And I said, what do I do then? He says, and then you plug in all along the way with circuitry that is 100% efficient from point of generation to point of use. I don't, know, I don't know if that works, but at least the person was thinking forward. And this is someone in the greenhouse industry who has built hundreds of acres here in Ohio and is actually a Canadian company because Canada needs the energy too. So I keep looking at this bowl and saying to myself, what is the answer? from the standpoint of energy production. And I ask all the electrical unions that are listening to this broadcast today, help me think this through. What is the future for us? Or is our energy future producing hydrogen off nuclear, all right? We have the only nuclear power in Ohio. It hasn't been respected by the company that is responsible for generating it. And the workers saved our lives at least three times now, three times, right? We have to have better management and we need vision we need to have a way of creating hydrogen hubs here or ways of producing energy for the future that are cleaner. And um, our people have to help us create that. I just wanted to put that out there for people because I am looking for ideas as the Congresswoman who has to represent the whole country in energy, but I want my area to be the leader because Thomas Alva Edison was born in this district in Milan, Ohio, and we should do no less. And First Solar is the most important solar company in the country now, and it is in our region. So we are very proud of that. And I think in energy production and transmission, we can be a, we can be a global leader if we put our minds to it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. BGA would be happy, happy to uh, be part of that conversation for sure. Um, we have our toes in a lot of different uh, ideas and avenues. So um, yes, to all the uh, IBWs that are on the call, the building trades, can't see y'all, but please, please, let's get together and uh, think it all through. And <clears throat> um, I have two more very quick slides, uh, if we can go to the next one. Um, as you can see here, there are numerous opportunities that will be need to be tracked, mapped, and highlighted as these federal dollars come to the great state of Ohio. At BGA, our amazing policy staff will continue to dive in, monitor, and flag opportunities that will strengthen American manufacturing, create new and support existing jobs, and as this slide illustrates, some of these exciting opportunities, which we just don't have the time to go into now, but we are tracking these. And then finally, in the next slide, uh, the Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act, IIJA, is the start, not the end, of what we need to build back better. It includes significant funding with an emphasis on high road standards. The Blue-Green Alliance will continue to engage and advocate for good union jobs, 
and strive towards a clean and healthy environment. The last slide uh, right here, the next slide has uh, my contact information and uh, our organization's website. Encourage anybody and everybody to reach out at any point. We'd be happy to continue the conversation. And thank you again for including us. Thank you, Lee, for participating. I know uh, how vital your work is. And um, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Colonel Adams. He has a, um, a time crunch, and then we'll take questions at the end. And of course, questions on the chat uh, throughout, we'll, we'll answer those. Um, I did want to just say a word about the building trades academies that we have now, whether it's electrical workers, boiler makers, plumbers, and pipe fitters, all these extraordinary people, sheet metal workers up here in the north. I really believe, Lee, they need to be turned into a community college. I think that somehow with what they are doing, the way they teach, the, the, the extraordinary amount these individuals have to learn to be successful. If I go across my region, do you know most places in America don't have this? And we are going to need people. Uh, I would put mechanics and machinists in that group because we have to retrain all of our first responders uh, to know how to repair electric vehicles. The country right now is close to a million mechanics short. Uh, the de dealers, even auto dealers in my region, don't have enough mechanics. Each one could hire 16 people. We don't have them. The workforce development money in this bill could help to raise a whole new generation of people to go into these highly skilled fields. And I, I really do think that when we walk through these centers that have been built, their training centers, this is education. And what they've created is astounding. So I hope you might work with me and look at this and see how we can get accreditation starting at the junior high school level, going right up into a community college degree or an association with these building trades and get them the kind of recognition on the educational front that I think they deserve. Uh, they're, they're, just, they're, just, they're just amazing. And um, I've seen their work out at Davis Bessey uh, I've seen it in first, so every place I go, and I'm just saying, you know, something's not right here. They, they, have, they have built something world-class, and we need to showcase it. So maybe you can think about that with me as part of the workforce development sections of this bill. Happy to. Yes, yes. Right. The, the apprenticeship programs are amazing, and if anybody ever gets an opportunity to visit one, do it. It's, it's awe-inspiring. Yes, thank you so very much. Oops. Hi, good afternoon. This is Lieutenant Colonel Elans. Can anyone hear me? Okay, great. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Eli Adams. I'm the commander for the Buffalo District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, thank you, Congresswoman Captor, for including us on this awesome meeting and forum and uh, really look forward to hopefully some dialogue and, and questions. I'm also joined online by our Deputy District Engineer, Dave Romano, and our Programs and Project Management Branch Chief, Ron Kozlowski. So if there's any really tough questions, uh, I've got some backup with me. Um, but as one of 44 districts worldwide, our area of responsibility includes the watersheds of Lakes Erie and Ontario and comprises roughly 38,000 square miles ranging from Ohio's western border to the St. Lawrence Seaway. We're also one of seven districts in the Great Lakes and Ohio River Division, which includes our sister districts in Detroit and Chicago. So we're really well organized around the Great Lakes and the mission here. In Buffalo District, we have a team of about 300 project managers, engineers, scientists, and supporting staff, all of whom help de deliver a diverse range of capabilities to meet the economic and environmental needs of our nation here. Our facilities include 100 miles of federal channels and 35 miles of breakwaters across 36 harbors. We also deliver solutions to advance the coastal resiliency of our communities, as well as restoring our ecosystems. Our approaches include advanced techniques in coastal engineering and engineering with nature, and our district is also a national leader in radiological waste removal where we're cleaning up the Manhattan Project at sites in New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. It's a big mission. It's certainly bigger than the Corps of Engineers or the Buffalo District. So it really takes a team of teams and we really pride ourselves in establishing strategic partnerships. 
Um, right now we're working with our fellow districts to share resources on the increased workload that we've seen uh, through the IIJA. Uh, we also leverage research and development with academia and the Engineering Research and Design Center to deliver some innovative solutions for some of the complex issues you're aware of in the Great Lakes, like HABs and increased demand for beneficial use of dredge materials. Uh, for example, we're working with the Western Lake Erie Basin Partnership and uh, just last year carried out a phosphorus trap project in Defiance, Ohio, uh, which will provide a lot of lessons learned for mitigating phosphorus runoff from agriculture and uh, the associated HABs threat. Uh, but working with our partners is especially important to ensure we understand the full impacts of the challenges we face as we ensure we have the resources to tackle these issues. So we're incredibly grateful for this opportunity to be part of forums like this. And we also look forward to any feedback to support to our region. Um, we certainly have a lot of exciting developments to discuss. Uh, first, with the Congresswoman, your support and leadership on the Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee, we really appreciate our nation's focus on the resource needs for the Great Lakes in Ohio, both in normal appropriations and in the recent infrastructure plan. Ohio is an integral part of the interconnected Great Lakes navigation system, uh, which saves the country $3.7 billion in transportation and environmental impacts annually. Um, in a real strategic move to improve the resiliency of our national economy, the Sioux Locks will benefit from an additional $520 million towards the construction of a new lock chamber complete with upstream approach walls and replacement of a 100 year old pump system. Additionally, under the current authorizations, the Brandon Road Lock and Dam near Chicago will receive 225 million towards construction, which will help prevent transfer of aquatic nuisance species like the Asian carp, and while minimizing impacts to our Great Lakes navigation system. Across the whole Great Lakes, we've seen a steady increase in appropriations towards important projects like these, and uh, just the past 10 years, you know, funding with the president's budget, congressional ads, and national stimulus acts have increased our annual funding from across the Great Lakes districts from be below 100 million uh, per year to amounts well north of 300 million uh, in the current fiscal year. And just my time with the Buffalo district, we've had back to back record years of obligations uh, towards new projects and with significant investments uh, you know, addressed in the IJ, we look forward to yet more support in our normal appropriations for harbors in Ohio, like Toledo, Lorraine, and, and Sandusky, all of which have received appropriations for dredging and repairs to our navigation and infrastructure. Of course, we've got several challenges still ahead of us, and we still have a sizable backlog of maintenance with much of our infrastructure being, you know, dating back to World War II, and our dredging backlog is roughly in the neighborhood of 10 to 12 million cubic yards still. We're also working with the state of Ohio on some of their goals for beneficial use of that dredge material. Uh, though unfortunately we have experienced some lag in the availability of alternate placement sites. Uh, so we we're not able to dredge all the harbors uh, we intended to last year. Uh, nonetheless, we're incredibly grateful for opportunities like this. Um, you know, hear from the communities, some of our par partners out there. Uh, we don't work a lot with uh, the Ohio Department of Transportation um, on matters other than maybe regulatory, but uh, certainly are connected with the OEPA and the o ODNR on some of those efforts I mentioned earlier. Um, but again, really lo looking forward to some feedback, maybe questions, um, and where we can help, uh, you know, deliver our needs for our nation, whether it be commerce, environmental, or uh, flood risk management. And then I'll, uh, I'll try to make up time here for uh, the meeting. Um, you know, again, I, I just like to say, you know, I was born in Columbus, uh, but I grew up in Cleveland area and, uh, it's been a real thrill for me to be a part of this mission, uh, both professionally. It's also been personally very rewarding and I uh, couldn't imagine a better time to be a part of the mission. As you mentioned, ma'am, having a once in a generation bill like this come through and, um, be able to be, be part of the effort to, to really, uh, revitalize our region and, uh, improve. Uh, quality of life as well as the strength of our nation in this part of the world as a real honor um, so i'd just like to thank you again one more time for your for everyone's time here and really look forward to the discussion so i'll pause there if there's any questions i know we're a bit over time and uh, certainly if uh, dave romano or, or ron kozlowski have any other uh points to to transmit uh, then that is yours Colonel, any questions? I just I just, we're so proud of you. I'm sorry, I think earlier when I introduced you, the mute was on or something. I'm capable of that. Um, and, uh, but I, I wanna thank you. We're so proud of you as a Buckeye. 
and uh, you have big responsibilities for the country. And I hope you know how much the American people appreciate it and all of your assistance for sure, uh, Ron and uh, Mr. Romano, we know you don't get a lot of recognition um, and your work is just so vital to us. Uh, personally, I would appreciate, and I'll take it off your uh, slide presentation. I need to explain to the people of the Great Lakes why the Sulak is important. People don't understand that. And uh, I think more people understand why it's important to keep the Asian carp out of the Great Lakes. <laughs> but uh, for the Sulak, uh, the, the boost this is to all of our ports and to our manufacturing uh, industry is just so important and to interlake shipping. So um, we are excited about that. I, uh, I can't wait to be a part of all the ceremonies that are gonna attend to it, but any materials you have that I could share with our constituents in this regard would, would be appreciated. Um, we're over time, but again, I wanna thank everyone uh, for joining us. We will make all the materials available to you. If, it jo if you joined late, I would please ask you to look at what I call the crib sheet words and phrases from the thousand page bill that you can look through and highlight if you have projects in your area that fit into one of these categories. Then we have a sheet showing how much money Ohio is getting in different categories and we can make that available to you. We'll have to put together a real coalition to um, contact the state to make sure we get our fair share. Then we have a 20 page summary uh, some of which we summarized here today. And then we will maintain contact with you using our library system, NOACA, other entities that we have to let you know when competitive grants are available. But I will ask NOACA along with Temecog and the other organizations, our county engineers in all of our counties to work together so that we develop a streamlined system to notify when a given grant is announced for application. And, uh, so, and to make sure that our planning dollars are the first dollars that we regionally ask for so we can put a team of experts together to work with every community and interest across the region to really reboot our community for the future. So I wanna thank everyone uh, for joining us, Grace Gallucci from Nawaka, Lee Geis uh, from the Blue Green Alliance and uh, Colonel Eli Adams and your capable staff, uh, Ron Kozlowski and Dave Romano for joining us today and giving the first introduction of uh, the significant amount of money uh, in the infrastructure legislation that is now the law of the land over the next five years that aims to transform and innovate the infrastructure of this country at a level that we have never seen in our lifetimes. And we intend to do it. Thank you very, very much. All the best and we'll see you again.